something, distancing himself from Martin Luther and perhaps serving to balance the Reformation and maybe even turn the tide. Rasmus was a bit reluctant to do that at first, but eventually he did write a treatise, a book on the freedom of the will. It was this very issue. Erasmus wanted to say that the will was free. Indeed, it must be free, said Erasmus, and he said it for very much the same reasons that had impressed Pelagius. You can't say that men and women are responsible before God and guilty if they fail to live up to God's standards, if they don't have free will. Well, Erasmus, as I said, wasn't very interested in the subject. He was somewhat deferential in the way he presented it. And he rather hoped, I suppose, that Luther would exercise the same kind of scholastic moderation. But not Luther. Luther very seldom exercised moderation in anything. And he wrote a book in response to Erasmus's treatise called The Bondage of the Will, in which, if you read it carefully, the only good thing he has to say about Erasmus is that at least Erasmus has attacked the central issue. Luther recognized, even if Erasmus had not fully recognized it, that it is at the point of the bondage of the will that we really come face to face with the extent of our depravity. Luther went through the Bible in that book, a big book, from beginning to end, taking verse after verse after verse. It shows that sinful men and women are so corrupted by their sin that even when the gospel is preached to them, they're unable to choose God unless God, first of all, operates in them to regenerate them or make them alive, that is, change their thinking and give them a desire for things they didn't have before, as the result of which, not because they have it in themselves, but as a result of what God did, they now see things differently and come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. Well, uh, this, as I said, was repeated in the case of Arminius and the followers of Calvin, and it has been battled through at other periods of church history as well. Now, in uh, earlier years, when I was talking about the freedom of the will, I used to talk about Luther's view and say at this point that what Luther was saying was this, and I made this my view, that although we have free will in lesser and unimportant things, we do not have free will in all the major things. And I put it like this, you and I can exercise free will in what we choose to put on as clothes in the morning. You can put on a red tie or a blue tie. You can decide to wear a dress or a blouse and skirt. When we go to a restaurant, we have a choice of what we'll eat on the menu. We can have chicken or we can have roast beef or we can have something else as well. All kinds of choices we make in that area. I pointed out that uh, in the intellectual area, we're unable to make choices. That is in the sense that if my IQ is 120, I can't, by the mere exercise of my free will, turn my IQ into 140. And uh, unless I am an Olympic class runner, I cannot, by the free exercise of my will, decide to run the mile in four minutes or the 100-yard dash in eight seconds. I just can't do it. And I often said when I was trying to teach Luther's view, and this is Luther's view, that although the will is free in all those areas, it is not free in the important areas, and above all, it's not free in the area of our relationship to God. We cannot, by ourselves, by the exercise of our own free will, choose Him. Now, as far as it goes, that's all right, but I have learned not to speak that way anymore. And the reason is that in the meantime, between my early reading of Luther and his bondage of the will, I read Jonathan Edwards' treatise on the freedom of the will. And that has changed my thinking, not as far as the conclusions are concerned. Erasmus and Pelagius said one thing, Augustine, Luther, Jonathan Edwards, and Calvin, and all the others said quite a different thing. They were one in what they were saying. But Jonathan Edwards saw the matter so profoundly and has written so helpfully that I no longer speak about the will in the same way I used to. Now, anyone who turns to Jonathan Edwards' treatise notices something different immediately. It is called a careful and strict inquiry into the prevailing notions of the freedom of the will. 
What's striking about his title is that he uses language that is the exact opposite of what Martin Luther used. Martin Luther called his book The Bondage of the Will in response to Erasmus's book The Freedom of the Will. Now Jonathan Edwards comes along in Luther's tradition, but he writes a treatise not on the bondage of the will, which was Luther's title, but on the freedom of the will. Now it is true when you read that title, and they're not saying in itself that Edwards is arguing for the will's freedom. He's only writing on the prevailing notions that concern the freedom of the will. But when you begin to read it, you find that the freedom of the will, in a certain sense, is exactly what Jonathan Edwards is affirming. Now, Edwards does three things in this treatise, and let me go through them, because they really are helpful in understanding this matter. First of all, Jonathan Edwards defined the will. It's striking that nobody had done that before. Everybody had just automatically assumed that they knew what the human will is, just as we naturally think we understand what it is. Isn't the human will that thing in us that makes choices? Well, Edwards said, that is not accurate. No, actually, the way it operates. Edwards defined the will as that by which the mind chooses anything. Now, you say to yourself, that's not much of a difference. Well, in words it's not, but in substance, it's a very great difference indeed. You see, when we say the will is that in us which chooses anything, we set the will off as a separate entity. Somewhere in us there is this thing that makes choices. When Edwards said the will is that by which the mind chooses anything, he was indicating that the choice is made not by the will necessarily, but that the essential choice is made by the mind and how it perceives things. Now, to put it in terms of the freedom of the will, what he was saying is that the will is free because the will must be free. The will always chooses what the mind thinks is best. If the mind thinks one thing is best, the will chooses that. If the mind thinks another thing is best, the Will chooses that. And what makes the difference, you see, is not the will, but how we perceive of things, and that involves our intellect. Now, the second thing Edwards contributed to an understanding of the will was what he called motives. That is, the reason why the mind thinks one thing is good and another thing is bad is that the mind is not neutral, but rather has motives which uh, concern its choice of one thing rather than another. This, of course, is where the difficulty with our choice of God comes in. Because if we have understood Romans 1 right in our study of it, we have seen that the sinful human mind, unaided by the grace of God, always considers that the worship of or service of God is undesirable. Here. As a proclamation of God, and uh, the call is made that we should turn from sin and respond to God through faith in Jesus Christ, but our mind says, that is something I don't want. I don't want to respond to God, because if I respond to that God, why, I'm going to have to acknowledge His rule over me. And that doesn't seem desirable to me. I want to rule over myself. And so although in one sense the will is absolutely free, either to choose or reject God, the mind, in its sinful form, always says that the choice of God is undesirable. So we reject God and go our own way, as Romans 1 says quite clearly we do. The final thing that uh, Edwards contributed to this discussion was the distinction between what he called uh, moral and natural ability or inability. And in dealing with this, he was uh, dealing with the problem of responsibility, which had so troubled uh, Pelagius. Pelagius uh, said, you remember, how can we be responsible for doing something if we can't do it? How can we be guilty for our rejection of God if in ourselves we're unable to choose him or seek him out? And Edward said, you have to distinguish at this point between a physical inability and a moral one. Physically, he said, we are able to choose God. Uh, but uh, it's in the moral area that we're not. And by definition, in the moral area, we are guilty. The reason we do not choose God is that we do not 